I enjoyed the recent kickoff of another football season, including watching the first week matchup between the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants. If I had tuned into the news at any point during that game, I might have seen the story about the mass shooting in Plano, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. It happened just before the game. Tragically, eight people were killed, nine including the shooter who was taken out by the police officer who responded to the call. Later, as I read through news story after news story, some familiar themes emerged. The shooter and one of the victims were embroiled in a divorce. On the night of the shooting, the victims were having a party that the victim's family called an out-with-the-old-in-with-the-new celebration. According to news accounts, the victim had been given possession of the family home just two days prior. Another interesting and likely relevant fact revealed by the family was that the marriage had been going downhill for two years, precisely the same amount of time they had owned the home. I've noticed this before. High-value acquisitions have a way of preceding marital conflict. Marital conflict has a way of resulting in one person in the marriage taking ownership of those assets, especially homes. It's usually the wife. This case wasn't any different, and unsurprisingly, there are emerging articles about this case speculating about the possible links between domestic violence and mass murder. I expect that more will be made of this in the future, and perhaps just as the fake news media did with Elliot Rodger, they will include an implied but unproven link between Spencer Height, the gunman in this case, and the men's movement. That would not be surprising. In fact, it's all but predictable. Height had been accused of domestic violence by the victim during the breakup. That isn't particularly surprising either. Accusations against men of violence happen in a whole lot of divorces, whether they were violent or not. And I doubt that many people will question the veracity of that claim in this case. After all, he did slaughter a house full of people. And he wasn't by any means the first. I've seen similar stories over the years. You can do an internet search on man kills wife over divorce and the returns will keep you busy for a very long time. This, too, isn't surprising. Divorce, in the best of circumstances, is fraught with tension and very hard feelings. In the worst of circumstances, it can be a protracted living nightmare, a depressing, destructive war that brings out the worst in human shortcomings. The violence it fosters isn't limited to homicide. If you do an internet search for man commits suicide over divorce, you might want to have a pot of coffee made. The nearly 24 million returns on that could have you reading for the rest of your natural life, even though it was eclipsed by the 38 million returns on men who killed their wives over a divorce. I don't think that speaks to the frequency of one compared to the other, though. It probably just reflects the fact that men killing themselves is a lot less newsworthy in this culture than men who kill women. If it bleeds, it leads applies a lot more to women than it does men. Once again, none of this is surprising, and in fact you have to figure that it's to be expected. Even with the overall decrease in marriage, there were over 800,000 divorces in the United States in 2016. See the link below. With that many emotional pressure cookers hitting critical mass every year, some tragedies are going to be unavoidable. With that in mind, and well aware of how divorce has a disproportionate negative impact on men at the hands of family court officials, I did a search for man kills judge over divorce. I found one return on a judge who had been murdered by a man while presiding over his contested divorce, and another on a man who shot his family court judge but failed to kill him. I went looking for more, but came back with nothing. Two cases, and that was it. Now that is surprising. 
Over the years, I've spent paying attention to what happens in our family courts, particularly the vicious injustices committed against men and their children. I've come to the inescapable conclusion that if I were a family court judge, I'd want a Secret Service detail and a robe made from black mylar. In a world where cause and effect apply in a somewhat rational way, family court judges would resign their positions and take up logging to cut the risk of death in the workplace. I think about all this in terms of divorcing men who are much more likely to turn their anguish into violence against themselves than anyone else. The National Institute for Healthcare Research in Rockville, Maryland, concluded that divorced people are three times as likely to commit suicide as people who are married. The Institute says that divorce now ranks as the number one factor linked with suicide rates in major U.S. cities, ranking above all other physical, financial, and psychological factors. And of course, by divorced people committing suicide, they mean men. They just don't want to say it. I suppose out of the realization that when you say men, nobody cares except feminists. And feminists only care because it licenses them to attack you for not pointing out that women, too, commit suicide related to divorce at about one-tenth the rate of men. It's no wonder. Consider what divorce is like for most men. Men find a mate, marry them, and routinely embark on a life where the importance of their wants and needs wanes till it vanishes. They work hard to provide and frequently come home to little else but more demands and more pressure. For many men, sex, formerly their reward for their sacrifices, is withheld, as well as love, affection, and approval. This is the state of chronic deprivation that a lot of men are living in when they are hit with divorce papers, informing them that they have to leave their home and say goodbye to their children, but they must continue to pay for both or face incarceration. They are stripped of their assets, their dignity, and as too many of them prove with the use of a gun, any reason they ever had in their minds to live. I find it impossible to pretend shock that some of these men take their wives out with them on the way out of their pain. Now, I can just imagine some trad cons and feminists clinging to each other right now in shock and outrage. That's disgusting. You can't possibly justify the actions of these horrible men murdering their wives just because they didn't want to be married anymore. You're excusing murder. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to justify or excuse anything. I'm just adding two plus two and getting four. Anytime you put a dog in a corner and kick it long enough and hard enough, it will come out snarling and snapping. When you subject human beings to a life of degradation and abuse, sooner or later, some of them are going to make you pay for it. You're free to label these men with whatever convenient form of evil you want. You can climb up on your pedestal of moral outrage and bellow at the messenger. You can crow your denunciations to the world about men who do the unthinkable, especially when you prefer that they take their abuse like men and say, please, ma'am, may I have another? And true to that, that is exactly what most men do. They suffer death by a thousand cuts without inconveniencing the world with their complaints just as they're programmed to do. Every once in a while, though, some men don't react according to the programming. The results of that have filled a few graves with the men, with the women they once loved, and sometimes even with their children. You don't have to justify or approve of that happening to accept that it's going to, whether you approve or not. There was a time until very recently that I thought of men's typical docile reaction to the socially sanctioned rape of their lives as a testament to their resiliency, 
to their ability to take the most brutal punishment without punishing the world in return. I don't really think that anymore. I think men taking this stuff without creating an epidemic of retribution only proves how beaten down most of them are to begin with. From the time they are born, we use the psychological warfare of weaponized shame to make sure they don't even start to think of themselves any differently than women think of them, as default pack animals who should be grateful for a stall in the barn and a pile of hay. And sometimes we even take that away. Generally, they don't react with anything but efforts to carry more weight. That's why the comparatively small number of men who do resort to violence in a divorce visit that violence on themselves. Some of you will remember the story of Thomas Ball, a man in Keene, New Hampshire, after long-running abuse by a family court, doused himself with gasoline and self-immolated on the courthouse lawn instead of dousing the courthouse with gasoline and burning it to the ground. Face it, boys, Ball wrote shortly before his death. We are no longer fathers. We are piggy banks. Link to that story below. Now, you can make any judgment about the man you want. Plenty of people have. I suppose in cases like these that most people simply render a judgment that makes them feel better, as they most certainly will with Spencer Height. I have my own judgment about Thomas Ball. He was being a good man. He took all that pain, all the anguish, abuse, and injustice, and he put it all right where society preferred that he put it, by burning himself alive. The world, except for a small handful of us that cared, just shrugged and moved on like he was never even there. I wish I had a greater moral to offer here a larger lesson that would help men endure what we see them go through every day. I don't, and I don't think anyone else does either. All I can do is what I already do every day. Encourage men to never put themselves in a place where their worth and their existence is vulnerable to the whims of a woman or the reach of a vile and corrupt judiciary that will act on her behalf. The fewer men that do that, the fewer men will be taken to a breaking point from which there's no return. And that is it for this talk. I hope you've enjoyed, even if I haven't, and I hope to see you next time.